Well, good evening. good evening. Nice day today. I heard 50 degrees tomorrow, so if you have some yard work you're not caught up on, this might be your, this might be your chance. This might be your chance. Nice to see you this evening. Thank you for being with us. We uh, begin our worship together with the order for confession and forgiveness, which you'll find on page 94 in the red hymnal in front of you. And let me invite you, please, as you're able, to stand. We are called together in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. God of all mercy and consolation, come to the help of your people, turning us from our sin to live for you alone. Give us the power of your Holy Spirit that we may confess our sin, receive your forgiveness, and grow into the fullness of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Let us confess our sin and now in the presence of God and of one another. We keep a moment of silent prayer here as we open our hearts and our lives to the God of all grace and mercy. Let's pray together. Most merciful God, we confess that we are captive to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. In the mercy of Almighty God, Jesus Christ was given to die for us, and for his sake, God forgives us all our sin. As a called and ordained minister in the Church of Christ, by his authority, I therefore declare to you the entire forgiveness of all your sin in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our opening hymn, number 314, uh, Arise, Your Light Has Come. The first reading is from Isaiah, the 49th chapter, beginning at the first verse. Listen to me, O coastlands, 
Pay attention, you peoples from far away. The Lord called me before I was born. While I was in my mother's womb, he named me. He made my mouth like a sharp sword. In the shadow of his hand, he hid me. He made a polished arrow. In his quiver, he hid me away. And he said to me, You are my servant, Israel, in whom I am glorified. But I said, I have labored in vain. I have spent my strength on nothing and vanity. Yet surely my cause is with the Lord and my reward with my God. And now the Lord says, Who formed me in the womb to be his servant to bring Jacob back to him, and that Israel may be gathered to him? For I am honored in the sight of the Lord, and my God has become my strength. He says, It is too light a thing that you should be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob. I will give you as a light to the nations, that my salvation shall reach to the end of the earth. Thus says the Lord, the Redeemer of Israel and his Holy One, to one deeply despised, abhorred by the nations, the slave of rulers. Kings shall see and stand up. Princes, they shall prostrate themselves because the Lord, who is faithful, the Holy One of Israel, who has chosen you. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The second, excuse me, the second reading is from Psalm, the 40th chapter, beginning at the first verse. I waited patiently for the Lord. He inclined to me and heard my cry. He drew me up from the desolate pit out of the miry bog. He set my feet upon a rock, making my steps secure. He put a new song in my mouth, a song of praise to our God. Many will see and fear and put their trust in the Lord. Happy are those who make the Lord their trust, who do not turn to the proud, to those who go astray after false gods. You have multiplied, O Lord my God, your wondrous deeds and your thoughts toward us. None can compare with you. Were I to proclaim and tell them, tell of them, they would be more than a, be counted. Sacrifice and offering you do not desire, but you have given me an open ear. Burnt offering and sin offering you have not required. Then I said, Here I am, in the scroll of the book it is written of me. I delight to do your will, O my God. Your law is within my heart. I have told the glad news of deliverance in the great congregation. See, I have not restrained my lips, as you know, O Lord. I have not hidden your saving help within my heart. I have spoken of your faithfulness and of your salvation. I have not concealed your steadfast love and your faithfulness from the great congregation. Do not, O Lord, withhold your mercy from me. Let your steadfast love and faithfulness keep me safe forever. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, good morning. How are you doing this morning? It's really nice to see you. And uh, uh, for those of you I haven't met yet, I am very excited. I'm looking forward to uh, getting to know you and to becoming your friend. I've been thinking about friends a lot this week. Uh, today in our Bible readings, uh, Jesus is making some new friends. He's meeting some people uh, who will be his companions. And uh, I was thinking about what it was like to have a friend and to be a friend. I, I bet you have friends. I bet you have some really good friends. Maybe a best friend. Maybe more than one best friend. Uh, 
I want you to think for a minute about who is your best friend and and why is that person your best friend? What is it about that person? Are they fun to be with? Do they do the same things that you like? Um, uh, do they make you laugh? Uh, are they nice to you? Do they uh, share things with you and help you out? I mean, there are all kinds of things that make us be friends, right? And, and uh, friends are so important. Life is really hard if we don't have uh, friends to share it with. What kind of a friend are you? What do you do for your friends? Do you share things with them? Do you spend time with them and help them when they have need? That's just as important as having friends is being a good friend being a friend for somebody else. That's what Jesus is teaching us to do here. He's, he's going to be friends for all of these people that he's meeting. And so I was thinking about what it, what it took to be a good friend. Uh, as I'm brand new here and I'm making new friends now all of the time, I was thinking about the qualities, about the things that make us a good friend. And when I think about being a good friend, you know who I think about? Uh, I think about Mickey Mouse. Right? Mickey Mouse was really good at making friends. He has really a lot of friends, right? He has Pluto and Donald and Minnie and Goofy and, and so many friends. And Mickey is a good friend because he's so nice, right? He's kind and he's generous and he's helpful. And that makes him a good friend. What makes you a good friend? As you go through your week this week, I want you to think about the things that you can do to be a good friend to somebody and maybe... Think about somebody who needs a friend, somebody new who you could be a good friend for as well. Will you pray with me? Dear God, we thank you for our friends. We thank you for the people who are good to us and take care of us and spend time with us. And we pray that you would teach us to be a good friend, to reach out to someone who is alone and help them too. We thank you for giving us Jesus to be our friend uh, and for the wonderful gift that he gives us. Be with us now and, and help us to have a really great day. Uh, we ask that prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. Have a really great day. Thank you. A reading from the Gospel of St. John, the first chapter. The next day, John saw Jesus coming toward him and he declared, here is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is he of whom I said, after me comes a man who ranks ahead of me because he was before me. I myself did not know him, but I came baptizing with water for this reason, that he might be revealed to Israel. And John testified, I saw, a spirit, I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove, and it remained on him. I myself did not know him, but the one who sent me to baptize with water said to me, He on whom you see the Spirit descend and remain is the one who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. And I myself have seen and have testified that this is the Son of God. The next day, John again was standing with two of his disciples, and as he watched Jesus walk by, he exclaimed, Look, here is the Lamb of God. The two disciples heard him say this, and they followed Jesus. When Jesus turned and saw them following, he said to them, What are you looking for? They said to him, Rabbi, which translated means teacher, where are you staying? He said to them, Come and see. They came and saw where he was staying, and they remained with him that day. It was about four o'clock in the afternoon. One of the two who heard John speak and followed him was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He first found his brother Simon and said to him, We have found the Messiah, which is translated anointed. He brought Simon to Jesus, who looked at him and said, You are called Simon, son of John. You are to be called Cephas, which is translated Peter. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Let's pray. Gracious and Heavenly Father, we are always looking, we are always seeking. Reveal yourself to us, draw us in close, that we may see and know your heart and that we may follow where you lead. 
We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. So how many of you have moved in any significant way in the last, I don't know, 10 years, 15 years, have had to pack up 20 years, right? How many of you have not moved at all in at least 20 years, have not, right? You're in for so much trouble. <laughs> so and it wasn't like I moved my whole house. Right? I moved just the things that were in my office, but it is amazing to me what you can accumulate in your life over 15 little years in just one little tiny office. And I swear, I swear that I was really careful at packing and I marked everything and I marked every box. Okay, this is books, it goes to Blair. These are books I will never read again. They go to the basement at the house and eventually to be thrown away. These are, right, and I had it all sort of sorted and I was really, really careful. So it's been two weeks now, a little more than that. Um, I have found about three-fourths of the things um, that I think I used to own. I have spent at least a few moments every day in the last two weeks saying, okay, where's that? Where did that go to? Now, it, I, I, you know, first, of course, my thought was, well, that's, you know, part of this, the joy of moving, right? Losing things is just part of the fun of moving. But it, I've come to think that maybe it's a, a, a greater human endeavor that we are always looking, that we're always missing something. But that's just kind of part of our nature, right? We are seekers in, in the, both the best and the worst sense of that word. We never have all of our things. We never have all of of anything. We're always missing out on something. We're always searching for something. And, and that can be great because it gives us purpose and mission and it draws us out. It can be so frustrating because we live this life in this sort of spirituality of scarcity where we're just pretty sure that we're missing out, right? F-O-M-O. -O. I don't know if you've seen those initiatives. Your children use them all the time when they're texting, right? Fear of missing out. It is what drives us. So I've, I've, th this all is popping into my head this week as I'm looking at this text. And if you want to put up the slides, this, this line from Jesus when he encounters John's disciples, what are you looking for? Right? John has identified Jesus, at least to John's satisfaction. And he's pointed him out now to his disciples, and they're going to follow because they are good disciples, and this is what they will do. And Jesus notices them, and, it, and he wants to know really what's on their heart. By the way, there is an interesting translation issue in this verse. Because that word, what, could just as easily have been translated, who. Who are you looking for? Suddenly now we are in a very different conversation, aren't we? Who are you looking for? When you walked in that door tonight, who were you looking for? When you walked into this room, who did you think that you were going to meet? I mean, when we frame it as a what question, then we get focused on doctrine and church stuff and religion. I mean, it, those answers are there too, right? John lists all of these lovely titles for Jesus. He is the Lamb of God, the Son of God. He's Rabbi. He's Messiah. Right? There are lots of what's in this encounter with Jesus. But who? The question who puts it to a very much different level. Because now it's not about what the disciples think. Now it's not about what the disciples believe. Now it's not about what the disciples will be a part of. Now it's about who they will be connected to. And that becomes our moment. When we take up this promise to follow Jesus, we're not just following in thought. We're not just following an idea. We're not just signing on to a program. We're not just buying into a religion. We're not just putting a bumper sticker on our car. We are putting ourselves into a relationship with a person. With a person. What do we mean for us to follow Jesus? What does it mean for us to follow Jesus? I, I mentioned last week, I had read several years back, this really wonderful book by Diana Butler Bass 
Um, and it was about freeing Jesus. And she was sort of suggesting some different sort of paradigms that we could be using that, that might set us free from this um, sort of prison of doctrine that we have built around the word and around Jesus and, and to open up some new ideas. And, and what I want us to think about tonight is what does it mean for us to think of Jesus as a friend, as a person, as a friend? Now, the first thing I want to do is disabuse you of a particular way of thinking about that, because a lot of people think, oh, I think of Jesus as my friend all the time. He is, after all, my personal Savior. I have accepted Jesus as my personal Savior. Right? You see the word that's in there, right? My. Jesus is my possession. Jesus is mine. He's my Jesus, which means he will fit into whatever categories I need him to fit into. He will do for me whatever it is I need him to do. Right? That we do really poorly. And we somehow turn Jesus into a, 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 a religion of our own creation. Luther said, we remake God in our own image. But what would it mean to think of Jesus as a friend, as an other into whom we have been called into a relationship? What would it mean to set Jesus free to be Jesus, and then what would that expect of us? How would we have that relationship? I mean, that is the thing about human relationships. They are often too much about possession. This is my wife. These are my children. Too much about power about who's in charge of that relationship, about who's in control. They're about winning, who's coming out ahead in this relationship. They're about getting, what do I get out of this relationship? But if following Jesus is about friendship, then surely it is defined not by what we get, by, but by what it takes from us. Because friendship, real friendship, Good friendship is about vulnerability in the end, is it not? It is about having that relationship where we can just be ourselves and open ourselves up and put everything right out there. A true friend is the person who knows us best, knows the good things about us and the bad things about us and loves us nevertheless. True friends are relationships that survive and endure when things go well and when things do not. And if we will be followers of this Jesus, if we will be friends of this Jesus, then we must be vulnerable in that way too. Not just something we can trot out when we need it, not just a possession we have when we can call upon but a relationship to really be ourselves. A relationship where Jesus can truly be himself as well. I, I think it opens up all sorts of possibilities for faith. And in, in, in the end, faith is about that kind of vulnerability, is it not? Faith is about that kind of honesty and that openness. Faith is not about control and not about doctrine. It's not about what we believe. It's about who we are and how we are when we are with Jesus. Faith, if faith is anything, it moves us. If faith is anything, it is a real part of us. If we will be friends with Jesus, then we must be vulnerable with him and with each other. What helps is to know that God is vulnerable too. This is a quote from uh, Dr. Butler Bass's book, right? This idea, God is lonely and wants a friend. Uh, when I read that sentence, I was blown away by it. I thought, that can't possibly be. God is God. God has everything that God needs. God could take us or leave us, surely. God has no investment in this except that. And then you read the word and you realize that God has every investment in this relationship, that, that God created a world simply for the sake of praising himself. Not just human beings, but 
but that the whole creation, I love that language in the Psalms, the trees and the rocks sing out his praises. That, that God exists for the sake of being in relationship with a world, with a creation, with you, is to me a pretty amazing thing. And if you don't think God is vulnerable and needful, then you have not seen Jesus on the cross. Because there is a God laying it all out for the sake of a friend. A God who will do anything for the sake of a relationship. And a God who calls us into those same depths if we will be his followers. And so John calls Jesus the Lamb of God. The vulnerable existence, the vulnerable person of the deity, God's fragility there on display for you and I. Not one who has come to conquer, not one who has come to control, not one who has come to demand, but one who has come to give and invites us to follow in that same relationship and be givers, vulnerable givers, fragile givers, too. Look, John says, look. Look and see the Lamb of God. It's a big deal, by the way, in the Gospel of John. John is constantly caught up with the idea of people just can't see. People just don't know because they just can't see. They won't open their eyes. They won't look. They're caught up in their own stuff. They like the darkness, John says. But along comes Jesus and John says to his followers, look, there it is. There is love on two feet. There is God in all of his vulnerability. There is the relationship, the friendship that you have wanted and needed the most. Look and see. Behold, the Lamb of God has come. In the name of Jesus, he has come. Amen. The hymn, wonderfully so, is number 336, and it's called Lamb of God. Living together in hope and trust, now let us confess our faith. 
I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. With the whole people of God in Christ Jesus, let us pray for the church, for those in need, and for all of God's creation. Most Heavenly Father, you have come and walked among us, and now you call us into this relationship, into this sacred space, to be your friend. You have dared to make yourself known to us. You have dared to make yourself vulnerable to us, and now by your Spirit grant that we might do the same. Give us the strength and the wisdom to leave our life and world behind, that we might follow you. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Open our eyes, Lord, to see you present in the world around us. Open our hearts to feel your love and the promise of our baptism. Where we are blind, where we are self-consumed, save us from ourselves. That we might know your love and that it might flow through all the things we say and do. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And so, O oh Lord, we lift up to you today this very needy and troubled world. And we ask that you send help, that you move our feet and hands for the sake of our neighbors near and far, that in our small works you make a difference for so many who struggle and suffer. We ask, O oh Lord, for your healing. We ask for peace. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We remember tonight, O oh Lord, our friends and neighbors who are in need, and we pray for those who are sick and hospitalized. We pray for those who are recovering from surgery, and fighting against disease. We pray for those who grieve, that they may know the gift of your presence. We ask, O oh Lord, now that you would look upon all who we name here before you in the silent prayers of our hearts. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. All of these prayers, O oh Lord, we give to you because of the grace and the mercy that you have always shown us in Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Yeah, I knew that was going to happen. Let's pray. Liberating God, you break the bonds of injustice. You let the oppressed go free. Now receive these offerings in thanksgiving for all the works of your merciful power and shape us as people of your justice and freedom. You we magnify and adore through Jesus our Savior. Amen. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread and gave thanks to God and he broke it and he gave it to his disciples. And he said, take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this, he said. Remember me. And again, after supper, he took the cup and he gave thanks and he gave it to them to drink. And he said, this cup is the New Testament in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this, he said. Remember me. And so we pray together in the way he taught us to pray.
Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. If you are joining us now on the live stream or for those who will be communing in their pews, receive this gift of the grace of God. This is the body of Christ given for you. This is the blood of Christ shed for you.
Now may the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you always in his grace. Amen. Holy One, we thank you for the healing that springs forth abundantly from this table. Renew our strength to do justice, to love kindness, and to journey humbly with you. Amen. And now the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you with mercy and grace. The Lord look on you with favor and give you his peace. Amen. Our closing hymn number oh, 696, two verses, first and last. Okay, two verses, first and last. Let's stand, shall we, as we sing. Go in peace and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.